El Cajon Pass, one of the most dangerous and infamous mountain passes in the United States. Located in the San Gabriel Mountains, this steep 2.2% grade is not only tough to climb, but it's also hard to roll down without going too fast. It's also the site of not one, not two, but three runaway trains. This is the story of the first one, where it all began. On May 12, 1989, in the early morning, Southern Pacific 7551 East was making its way towards the grade. The train consisted of 69 hoppers loaded with trona, a non-marine evaporative material mined as a source of sodium carbonate and sometimes used in fertilizer. It was hauled by a total of six locomotives, four leaders, and two helpers. On the head end was SD40T-2-8278, SD45R's 7551 and 7549, and an SD45T-2-9340. On the helper end was SD40T-2-8317 and SD45R 7443. The crew called in to handle this train were 33-year-old engineer Frank Holland, 35-year-old conductor Everett Crown, both in the lead unit, 43-year-old brakeman Alan Reese, who was in the third unit, 42-year-old engineer Lawrence Hill and 57-year-old brakeman Robert Waterbury, who were both in the helper unit 7443. They depart Mojave Yard early in the morning, heading for West Colton Terminal in California, where another train will take it down to South America. A little after 7 a.m., they reach the grade. Before they go, though, they test their brakes numerous times. Nothing seemed wrong so they head off towards the grade. As they go down, Frank Holland initiates the dynamic brakes first, using the engine's generator power to slow the train down. The speed limit for the grade, after all, is 29 miles an hour, and on the plus side, the pass curves nearly 56 times, so the friction helps slow the train down. Still, they apply their air brakes to hold it at a constant 25 miles an hour. That's exactly where Holland wants it, since that's a safe speed. Then something odd happens. Despite the air brakes, Brakeman Crown notices that the train is slowly creeping up to 30 miles an hour. It's slightly speeding, but then it creeps up faster to 35, 40, 50, even 65. At that point, they try and throw it into emergency, which kind of works, but it's not enough. The brakes begin to burn up, and the train begins to fly down the hill as fast as 90 miles an hour. Way too fast. At this point, the engineer wasn't even in control anymore. He and the rest of his crewmen became passengers, and gravity has hijacked the controls. They call ahead to West Colton Terminal, informing them about their problem. Then, Frank remembers that there's a set of houses at San Bernardino, right beside a curve right there that the crew lost all hope. The locomotives jump the tracks and the hoppers tumble down behind, plowing through the houses like nothing. The Trona spills everywhere, covering what wasn't crushed, like a sandstorm had just went by. Literally every car and every engine jumped the track. People were still having their breakfast or taking a shower when this rude awakening came through their neighborhood. When the dust settled, the site was a complete mess. People feared something like this would happen, and now that nightmare was reality. Some people were even buried in what was once their homes. Even a swimming pool was no match for the train. The lead engines that suffered the worst damage lay upside down or on their sides, still smoldering. While the two helpers were mostly upright from the crash, Frank Holland amazingly climbs out of his crushed lead unit, but is badly injured with a punctured lung and several cracked ribs. 
The two crew members in the helper unit were lucky and escaped very serious injury. Since they were at the back, it received the least amount of force when the train came off the track. They desperately called dispatch for emergency services. Sadly, Conductor Crown was fatally killed in the lead unit, along with Alan Reese in the third. Additionally, two other people in their homes were killed, including seven-year-old Jason Thompson and nine-year-old Tyson White, who were crushed and asphyxiated when the train destroyed one of their houses along Duffy Street. In total, four people died, and seven were injured. Then everyone asks, how could a train run away like this? And why? Vandals? Kinked air hose? Faulty brakes? A sleepy crew? What was it? Well, before that could be answered, there was still more trouble. No one realized that the train derailed on an underground gas pipeline buried six feet underground. The train didn't break it, however. But after the engines and the cars were cleaned out and removed, on May 25th, at 8 in the morning, a dope in a backhoe was cleaning the spilled trona. But despite the clear markings in the ground on where the pipe was, the operator accidentally made gashes into the gas line. And then, all fiery hell broke loose. The gas leaked and caught fire, destroying 11 more houses, 21 cars, and brutally burning two residents alive in the inferno. Five of the houses that were destroyed were, across, were directly across from Duffy Street that were already crushed by the train, while another was the only house on the track side on Duffy Street and that was still fully intact after the crash, but was destroyed in the fire. Four more houses received moderate smoke damage and fire damage, while three others only had smoke damage. The fire burned for seven hours, sending plumes of heavy smoke into the air until it was finally brought under control. The total property damage was over $14.3 million. Interestingly, more of this damage was from the fire instead of from the train accident. Interesting, huh? And even though there were more fatalities in the derailment, it's still kind of interesting. In total, now six people were dead from both incidents combined. Now the whole area was like a true war zone, and residents were both horrified and furious. What was next to come? The water main breaking and then the whole street floods? Thankfully that didn't happen. After months of investigation, the FRA and the NTSB found out that before leaving Mojave Yard on May 11th, that upon the crew boarding the train, it was discovered that the original head unit, 7551, and the locomotive the train was named after, was totally dead and couldn't start. And the crew were then instructed to take 8278 from another consist and add it to their own, ahead of the dead 7551. Also, the weight of the train was severely underestimated, and the wrong tonnage was given to the crew before they left. They were told the train was 6,151 tons, when actually it was 8,900 tons after another dispatcher found the correct measurement. Plus, all but two units had fully operational dynamics, with 7551 still totally dead of everything but its own air brakes. 7549 had traction current, but no dynamic brake current. 9340 had dynamic brakes that were rather wacky and had limited power. 8317 on the helper end also had no dynamics. Thus, among the four locomotives in the front and the set of helpers on the back, only 8278 at the front and 7443 at the back had fully functioning dynamic brake systems. Although this badge didn't know. With all that weight, both the air brakes on the cars and the locomotives, as well as the dynamic brakes that were working on the two units, just couldn't handle both the grade or the weight. After the accident, calculation procedures to train weight was majorly overhauled. All four locomotives at the front of the train, 8278, 7551, 7549, and 9340 were all damaged beyond repair and destroyed. They were sold for parts to Precision National and scrapped on site. And both helper units did derail, but they were still operable. 
8317 was sold to Precision National, repaired, then resold to Helm Leasing for continued service. 7443 was repaired and repainted by the Southern Pacific and returned to service. It was finally retired on March 17, 2000 and sold to National Railway Equipment Company, who rebuilt it with 5 foot 6 inch gauge trucks for MRS Logistica in Brazil. I do apologize if I pronounced that wrong. Renumbered as 5313. All 69 hopper cars were totally destroyed and scrapped at the site. As a result of this and other runaways involving locomotives with dynamic braking, the FRA reserved its mandate that dynamic braking be disabled when train brakes are placed to emergency. Now, the mandate is that all dynamic brakes must remain functional. It's been 29 years since this crash, and despite these changes, runaways have still occurred, especially on El Cajon Pass. And the worst thing about it is, there's still two left I need to cover, one in 94 and one in 96. I'll tell you all about them in the future, but we have another runaway to cover that I'm sure everyone knows. Stay tuned for more. Ninety-three forty had dynamic brakes that were rather rack, rather wacky. Fuck. <laughs>